Hello and welcome again to another episode of Legends of Land Rights. I have great pleasure today in introducing to you one of the most respected elders of Camilleroy country, a respected elder indeed throughout New South Wales and Australia. Lyle Munro Senior, he fought for a treaty for us. Lyle Munro Senior fought for legal services for us, Aboriginal medical services, social justice, and of course, Aboriginal land rights. Lyle Munro is a man amongst men and a leaders of our leaders, truly one of our legends of land rights. Lyle Munro Senior, thanks for your, uh, thanks for your time and thanks for agreeing to do this interview. Lyle, you've been involved for, for many, many years now with Aboriginal rights, not just on the land rights issue, but, but just social justice, um, just human rights. How did you first start getting involved? Well, I came to Moray as a junior porter on the railway in 1950. And the Moray community had what they call the Aboriginal Advancement Committee. And surprisingly, that was made up of um, eight or ten prominent leading citizens of Moray, Europeans. <clears throat> and um, I didn't get involved straight away until I started playing football with Maury and I got barred in a couple of cafes. And that's when Maury was known as a little rock of Australia and they had two motions on the book. One was that you couldn't swim in the pool if you're an hygienic people. And that was mainly aimed at Aboriginals because the simple reason is that they're on the river banks and tin huts. They had no water, no sewage, washed the clothes in the river and boiled in the river with soap. <coughs> and um, the other motion was allowed that you weren't allowed to walk on the public footpath, served in pubs or clubs or cafes, or sit up the back in picture shows. You could sit down the front, but not up the back. And um, when I was leaving a little place called Currabubula, the local policeman said, Lyle, are you going to Maury? And I said, yeah, why? He said, you better get your citizen rights because you'll need them in Maury. And I said, that's later on known as the dog tag. <clears throat> so me and my father both got citizen rights at the same time. I think it was 1947, I think. But when I came to Maury, then I was the only Aborigine playing with Maury, the late Georgie Taylor, who should have played for Australia. He couldn't because of his colour bar. He handed his 5'8 position over to me. So and I represented Maury for quite a while. And I started to talk Aborigines coming out of the briar bushes and tin huts to take part in football and more, and that's how it started. And then uh, <clears throat> I was approached to join the the Moree Aborigine Advancement Committee, and um, then I became secretary there, and I went away and represented that Advancement Committee. And surprising in them days, so. All the expenses that was paid by government people with the welfare system would pay you two or three days away to the conference or a week away from the conference. <coughs> and um, that's how I got involved. The old people took me down the river bank because I was carting grog for them in the pubs and told me to sit down, a lot of them I'll return to soldiers and how come you got a job on the railway? How come that you got citizen rights? How come you can play football and more and get served in pubs with other white people? And um, so I was given instructions then what to do. We want decent homes in Moree, we want employment in Moree, we want all the same things that I had when I came here that they didn't have. So I didn't read out of books or go to university because 
I'm still doing the same thing, the instructions they gave me the day, because they still exist. Employment, education, all those problems. And uh, <clears throat> that's how I got involved. And I'm still a strong believer in the elders, what they've done, and I still think about them days. And I've based all my involvement around Australia, and nationally and internationally, all from the advice of them old people. And um, I only wish to God this present day young people, leaders we got and educated would start looking at advice from the elders and go back to where we really started from. You, you were involved in the Aboriginal Lands Trust prior to the, um, the, the, the passage of the uh, New South Wales land rights legislation. Tell, tell us about your, your involvement there with the Lands Trust. Well, it's probably the greatest experience of my life. First, because it was a statutory decoration body that played a dual role. It advised the, uh, the government on all welfare matters. And it was successful in closing down Kinchler Boys' home, Cootamundra's home, Girls' home and all them institutions and held in trust all land that was left by the Aboriginal Protection Board and the old uh, the land, land trust took control of that all as far as car bodies and dumps and all that and all the land, tin huts, took control of all that. But we then handed that all that back 99 years, released back to the community. So I, I don't know how uh, the people handed all that back, that the land trust deed and titles back to the state. Who owns it now has got this beyond me at this stage, and it's, but it's up to the community to do what they want to do. But the lands trust didn't only just get government land. I, I understand that there was also uh, non-Aboriginal people that that bequeathed some land to, uh, you know, left land in the will to the Aboriginal Lands Trust as well. That's true. Land Dilo was the one will from prominent people that died and left the will and um, for the Aboriginal community in New South Wales. The only thing we could do at that time as trustees. We built that uh, office, land, land council office in uh, um, in Sydney, and which was to the tune of somewhere about five hundred thousand dollars at the time, and all that's gone over to the present land rights mob now, the land councils. And not not satisfied with just being involved in that lands trust, you then went on to uh, to the National Aboriginal Conference, the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee. Those were formidable years, from a federal level. For Aboriginal people as well. Well, the Land Trust and Land Council was the only statutory bodies in the world that had the rights to buy and sell. It had mineral rights above and below the ground, except coal and and gold. But it also had hunting rights and fishing rights, which was a big thing too. And it held in trust or. <coughs> all land belonging to Aborigines. And was successful without going to court to places like Wurrimurringal and a lot of the big missions around New South Wales. We had all them given back to us by simple negotiation with the minister during that period of time. We didn't have to go into court and argue for the land. It was, we done it in a sensible way. <coughs> but we also sent young people around Australia to be initiated in tribal law which I'm afraid that's not happening in present land council. And it's a pity because we're losing our identity and, uh, and the history of our, of our race and our laws and customs. And the last 30 odd year we seem to be at a standstill, so. And it is 30 years since the uh, New South Wales Aboriginal land, land rights legislation was enacted. How did you feel when that first came about? I mean, here you were, you know, greatly ensconced in the uh, in the lands trust. 
then a new body takes over, new land rights. You had the activism that was going through by a lot of young people that were, were um, you know, they weren't happy with the way that the land rights legislation was going nationally, but, and even the land rights legislation that was put forward before the state parliament, there were still big demonstrations against that. How did, how did Lyle Munro feel about the swap over or the, or the change from a lands trust into an actual legis land rights legislation? Well, I remember the same time I was on the board of the New South Wales Aboriginal Legal Service. I remember Paul Coe and young Lyle and lad Dilly Craigie and a few solicitors sitting around the table saying, Munro, we're going to close the land council, land trust down uh, and we'll send you a reef. I said, right, and then if it don't operate, I'll send you a reef. <laughs> 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 so we were totally disappointed. I, I led the march that night and uh, being Robert Ticken was the first to get thrown in the paddy wagon. He wanted to be minister for Aboriginal Affairs. But uh, they knocked, pulled the fence down at uh, the state government office. I think Charlie Perkins was the first to go head first into the cops' hands, I think. <coughs> but they took a vigil there all night. We had a barbecue in the street and blocked the street off. But that was in the radical days, you know, and that. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of them people stood up and lay a lot of guts, you know. Young kids all went on from there and went on to be prominent leaders in New South Wales. Took part in the legal service. Co went on to become barrister and your brother, whose photo sits in my lounge here. He went on to be the Aborigine Supreme Court judge. Pat O'Shane done the same, she done the same. So there were some positive things come out of that, uh, the radical days and we need a radical day now because we're going backwards and we're standing still, we're losing our identity. We're not teaching the young kids the way we should uh, about our laws first because the tribal law 200 years has never changed, not one bit of it's changed. And you never learn anything about Aborigines until you get out in Central Australia and mix with the tribal people. You sit down and listen to, listen to their, their talk. But under the legislation, just after the legislation um, in 83, I think Terry Hi Hi was one of the first stations that, were, uh, that was actually handed back to Aboriginal people. That's true. It was, uh, there's 1,700 acres there now. The first... 700 acres came over with uh, the old land trust and then another 1,000 acres came over later on. But uh, then I was successful in, in the NAC days <coughs> buying a 10,000 acre property called Nardula and the middle camp, which is known as the middle camp, there's over 100 hectares there. All that's sitting there and one it, nothing's been done about it. Nobody's worrying about what they want to do with and do. And a lot of people haven't got that sort of land, you know. <coughs> but they own that land full deed and title. That's the local Aboriginal Land Council. Local Aboriginal Land Council. How, how did ex Lands Trust members, uh, I mean, surely you must have caught up after the. Um, <coughs> After the after the land or after the lands trust was put into the new um, legislation, how how did the old lands trust members feel about the new legislation? Well, we went down with the ship like good captains. So the cops had to drag us out of the office in Landala. <laughs> I remember the cop was going to pinch me. Somebody was smoking. I said, "Put that cigarette out. That I'm getting we're getting blacks to get the blame for burning the place down." And this copper went, hmm, did I hear what you said? I said, oh, kick, kick a pig in the guts and get that same grunt and they're going to lock a lot of us up. <laughs> <laughs> the girls were crying, so we don't want to go to jail. <laughs> but there was still animosity against the, um, I mean, uh, particularly against young people that were, you know, the, the, the so-called radicals of the day. Yeah. There, there was still some ill feeling, um, and I understand even today, <coughs> there's some ill feeling there. Of, of some of the surviving members of the Lands Trust against 
some of the young ones that led the right, led the led the led the marches for land rights. Yeah, only because it was the only one of its kind in the world, and the indigenous people had it was a statue of body that played a dual role. Build and trust all land belonging to Aboriginal people, and successfully reclaimed other big reserves such as Wurri Moringal and Murren Bridge. <coughs> Motawindji. Yeah, all those places, and we didn't go in the court arguing. We'd done that sheer determination through there. We trained staff too. Besides, we trained our own legal staff, <coughs> and. Uh, Toured New South Wales regular in different sections of the of the state and took our staff. And everything was documented about it and accounted for every cent. <coughs> How do you, um, when you have a look at the Northern Territory land rights legislation and you compare it with the New South Wales land rights legislation, what to you is the better legislation? Oh, New South Wales stands out a long way. In what way? Well, it had, it had <coughs> ownership. Ownership and... Uh, but some people didn't, didn't change over to the land trust straight away. They didn't disband that straight away. Some kept their land trust until they finally found out that the New South Wales Legislation was the most powerful of a lot in Australia and probably the world. Is there one thing that you look at the land rights legislation that shouldn't be in there? Or, or, or is there something there that you look at that, that has caused hardship, for instance, social housing? Yeah, well, that's um, they're losing control of their houses, on the reserves and all that. They're losing control of self determination. And we're losing it fast, you know. The missions have fallen down, deteriorated. Nobody seems to have any interest as Aboriginal people. We now have some terrible things, situations in front of us. We've got the drug scene, we've got gambling and drinking, worse than it ever was. But in the old days, <coughs> lived on the mission, we'd get drunk and go to work. There'd be you leave the mission five o'clock in the morning and nothing to see, you know, dozens of old people going to work with a sugar bag over their shoulder, going out walking to work five or six miles. Today they've got transport and all that and that uh, you've got the Aboriginal employment set up here in Moree and they don't, don't really support that. You've got a cafe set up here, they don't really support that. The land is sitting there idle and acres and acres of valuable ground, the most valuable blocks in Moree is sitting there. Nobody's looking at the interest of the, their grandkids or their great-grandkids' future. It seems to be all about themselves. You, you were there in the, um, in, in the NAC days when Bob Hawke was Prime Minister. Why did, why did Bob Hawke back down on land rights? He'd, he'd promised you the NAC that he would legislate for national land rights what, what happened there? What was his change of, of, of mind on that? Well, that worries me a bit because you read about what, what happened later on about Bob Hawke and the land, land rights. And I sat with Bob Hawke and some tribal people that I found out later on they weren't truly representatives of their areas. But they smoked Bob Hawke cigars, but they didn't, uh, wouldn't accept his deal on land rights. And he asked me why wasn't they accepted, and I said, I can't answer that. And um, that worried me then when it went to Western Australia and Burke. <coughs> Played a big role in destroying the old structure because of the mining companies and he had publicity and all about what they, what land they were going to take and all this. Nook and Bar was a big issue at the time. <coughs> and we sent uh, Jim Hagan of the NAC at the time and the late Jimmy Bindery representing the tribal people and the legal service in Western Australia. 
but they didn't come back with the answer people wanted. But thank God they didn't find um, oil and drilling on Nook and Bar, and that's <clears throat> they got their, their land rights deal, their native native title there. <coughs> they got their um, land rights legislation through after thirty odd years. And Fred Cheney still talks to me about that. They waited too long because we all missed out on probably the treaty had a part of that. We missed out on land. And that worried me a bit in all my years in fighting. I always believed that Aborigines owned the land as all and uh, we should be entitled to the royalty, but it's royalty in land, and mining company, <coughs> gold, silver, and all that. As uh, not going to the community as an old. You just imagine all the royalties, all of them put in one one banking account and we had a treaty what that could do, run and control our own affairs. Well indeed, um, one of the ten point plans of the of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy was that two, three percent of Australia's gross, gross national products should go into a fund for Aboriginal people as a compensatory measure. Yeah, well, that was a part of the treaty. Then they travelled to every community in, in Australia, Ireland, including the islands. <coughs> Listen to the people's opinion what they wanted in the treaty. I remember there was one Aboriginal got up and said, now, why, sh why shouldn't we charge Every licensee holders in this country one dollar. Put all that into one kitty and pay pensioners or pay social security and child and and all that. But that was only a part of it. The gross income that at the time was the mining companies were running the millions and millions and millions. We never got the percentage of that. If we got the percentage of that, you know the treaty. We had um, the government representative was Dr. Coombs, the late Dr. Coombs. I wasn't happy with that, and the NAC executive wasn't happy with that. We said we want an Aborigine following Dr. Coombs, and where he goes, we we want to go. <coughs> so Philip Hall represent there uh, because he's my liberal ten at the time, and there was eighty-seven percent influential people are running this country and could rule the government and tell the government what to do really, supported a treaty. It's mainly Aborigines themselves that turned it down. Why? They, um, they listened to the wrong people. And they're still doing it today. I, um, I never changed listen to anybody. I never changed worrying about legislation. I still remember the, the legislation given to me and I'm sitting on the river bank with the old people. And all that, everything we talk about now, all, all was a part of that discussion with them old people. But who, who would sign a treaty? How, how would a Wiradjuri person, for instance, sign off on, you know, a Pitnijara? on behalf of Pitnijara people. I mean, would you have one treaty covers all or would you have different treaties signed with different uh, clans, different tribes? Well, that's uh, it's not a tricky question because the Pitnijara language just about operates in every state in Australia. <coughs> that is one reason I think we're, what we've done with Ayers uh, uh, Rock, giving the land back to Aborigine people and Pitnijara people are mainly a part of that. But would it be fair for some one person or one organisation to, to sign off on a treaty on behalf of all Aboriginal people? Now, the NAC was a good foundation, the National Aboriginal Conference. It was a democratic elected body of people. 79, I took the first democratically elected body of people over to Canada. That was Lois O'Donoghue, who went on to be prominent in Aboriginal affairs. <coughs> And um, one from uh, Kananara, what's his name? I'll come back to them in a minute.
But we went over and we addressed the National Indian, the 10th National Indian Brotherhood. And I was elected to the World's Council of Indigenous People Executive. And the executive only about five or six people governing. Worldwide. 800 million people worldwide. <coughs> and Ozzy Cruz was put in half of that week, governed half of the world. Ozzy Cruz was appointed to that. But we got speaking rights through the United Nations, through the WCIP, the United Nations. Nobody seemed to have followed that up, not as a democratically elected body of people in the country, see. And it's no good going over there if you're not democratically elected as a national body because people like the Indian race, you know, they, they won't listen to you, they'll talk to you, but they won't give you the support you wanted. So you've got to come back and mislead the people of the community. When you look at the statutory bodies we got, but we still haven't got a national body. What have we got? You look at sport, you've even got tennis, hockey, golf, boxing, rugby league, rugby union, Australian rules, athletics, gold medalists, tennis players. <coughs> You could pull all them people together as a national sports committee, but they're still not all democratically elected by the Aboriginal Island people. <coughs> but you must have a democratically elected body of people governing the nation. It's got to be supported by the people. And the only way you can do that is as a democratically elected structure for the people to elect who they want, not appointed people. All these people we got now are sitting there, call themselves professors and all that. What are they really achieving in this country at present, the last 20, 30 years? They're not a national body. They can send them TA all around the world, look important, but not solving anything. Do, do you fear for the future? <coughs> I'm concerned about the future. The future for your kids, for your grandkids, for your great-grandkids? Well, in the radical days, the soul, and you know, we all took part in that. And I remember we said, well, do you get past the system? Somebody said, you can't get past the system, it's like a brick wall. And then somebody said, well, let's, let's train people within the public service system and let the system gradually destroy itself. And that was going good. We started to get some honest black fellows in in the public service. And the government woke up to us, what we were doing, and what did they do? They started paying people. So they're paying people left, right and centre to represent Aboriginal people. Sitting fees, TA. You've got a national body now, you've got a national body up for the Labor Party. And what's the Liberal government said? They're going to select four people. And you've got a chairman who's got that, he's jumping from Labor to Liberal, Liberal to... Greens, you don't know where they're going and who they're representing. So what's going to happen to the national body? That's going to destroy it. And, but they've gained 30 or $40 million of funding that'll they'll solve the budget situation. See, they couldn't give us stuff. The government's not here to solve anybody's problem, brother. You have to fight for it. <clears throat> you only got to look where the radical movement came from. The black power movement in America, where it came from, what happened. <coughs> but thank God we had no shootings in Australia, although my house has been blown apart by shotguns. And my wife almost got shot, missed her about six inches, that's how close it was. Nobody's ever been charged with that. But I'd changed Maury in lots of ways, but I never want any credit for it. You never get credit in your own town. That's true. You can be a legend outside your hometown, but you can be a no 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 over in your hometown. <laughs> and, and and of course you would have been offered some very lucrative jobs and positions in your time. I was offered five hundred thousand dollars to leave this to run this room here. <coughs> to leave Maury. That's after a few things happened. Then I turned it down. Doug McGrady was sitting in one chair and my wife in the other. And she was giving me a lecture over, I spent 20 pounds in the tab. And I turned down half a million dollars. <laughs> Next day he came back, offered me 
$80,000 job in Canberra. No questions asked, all my furniture would be sent down there. And I said, don't come back in that gate again, otherwise I've got a shotgun there and I'll, you'll be carrying out, so you never came back. So I've been offered big money in my time, I've turned it down, because the system's not there to help anybody. <coughs> it's not there, to, you've got to fight for it, and the Aboriginal people have got to stand up, be proud of the 200 years of laws and custom. Not one bit of the Aboriginal law has changed, not one bit of it has changed in that period of time. I used to sit down out in, in the d desert with the tribal people and they used to say to me, what are them silly white buggers doing down there in the White House in Canberra? They change a piece of paper, they change the law every night. Every night they change the law. Our laws never change. <coughs> See, if we all know a bit about politics and all about the Aboriginal laws and customs and their system, there's <coughs> a big different out outcome. We have a foundation to do that, but it's not operating. Nobody's thinking about it. Sports represents sports, but it doesn't represent the nation, only if it's in the Olympic Games or something like that, like Kathy Freeman and things like that. But we have to have a national structure, a national body. Otherwise, we're gradually losing our identity and our, 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 our tribal ways and our kids are failing. They're taking the wrong road. They're taking the drug road. They're taking gambling road. They're taking the drinking road. And more easy town now, young people are dying from drugs, you know. That's never been a part of our culture or law or system. It's never been. So they're not killing us with kindness now. They're not poisoning the water, they're not fighting us and shooting us. They're killing us with kindness, with alcohol and drugs. You can go over to the district hospital in Moree, when I suppose they have 10 years on that board, me and my brother. You can go over there now and you can walk in and grab a pack of needles and walk out. I've seen one young bloke walk in there and pull up in the late model car Five packets, which is 50 needles. <coughs> Walking around, singing out, going around, the, the car taken out and waving. Oh, just won the lottery. Lottery. And that's a terrible, sad thing. <laughs>